this is the first talk I've ever given here without a time. Never thought I'm so out of What I want to talk about is intelligence research uh, and the title is 50 years of satisfaction. So, um, my serious interest in intelligence began about 1966 when I was an undergraduate, a few years ago. And so this is 2016, and that's about 50 years that I've been. Uh, the microphone, keep the microphone. Oh. <laughs> 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 oh <knows> one. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, that's 50 years. And um, for that 50 years, I've been asking one question: Why are some people smarter than others? It's on my Vita. People have told me to take it off, but it sounds too simple. But I, I think it's a good question. That's really what I'm interested in and what I want to know about. So, just to give you an idea of what 50 years is like, um, <laughs> about the same length of time as a rolling flow. And I'm just slightly older than seven, than, seven months older than, than Keith Richards, who I identify with. <laughs> um, if that isn't clear enough for sports fans, uh, it's also about as long as Cleveland has gone without winning a major sports championship until just recently. And they did win a sports championship. It was the Cavaliers. Um, probably a lot of you in here don't know about the Cavaliers, but they were down three games to one and performed the impossible feat of coming back to win 4-3 uh, against the Golden State Warriors, the, the winningest basketball team ever. So, um, how many of you know where Cleveland is? <laughs> A few of you. Many of you don't, and I hope by the end of next week you don't know where Cleveland is. <laughs> um, <laughs> the Republican National Convention is there, and um, they're not expecting to to go smoothly. Um, our university has been cleared out and shut down the first time in the whole time I've been there um, as, as a home for law enforcement people who are being brought in from all over the place. So, um, if you hear about Cleveland, I, I think it may not be good. Even if you don't, it won't probably be good. <laughs> um, so you should realize that um, the 50 years of satisfaction in the title refers to the next 50 years. Um, I think that the next 50 years in this field are going to be incredible, just fantastic, uh, astounding times. And I think you can see the roots of it here to, in, in this conference from the papers you've seen so far. Um, the last 50 years, you might might be described as you don't always get what you want, but if you try, sometimes you might find uh, you get what you need. It's, it's not the younger people that are smiling. You know? I don't know what that is. Um, okay. This is entirely my personal view. You could probably write this same thing and come up with a completely different orientation. But what I'm going to try and do is um, give you my impression of how this field is um, going. And I'm going to do it uh, by doing um, five areas that I can pretty well describe uh, the field. Um, we have psychometrics, cognitive, neuroscience, genetics, and the criteria predicted. And um, I'm going to do that for each area by briefly describing uh, first, the way it was in 1966, and then briefly summarize the state of knowledge that, that, that was there at the time. Um, and then I'll tell you what it's like in 2016 uh, using some of the things you've already seen here. Um, and then I'll give some ideas that I would like to see develop more fully. You may have some of your own. Um, after considering the progress made in each area, I will do something really stupid 
<laughs> I will attempt to predict what it will be like 50 years from now. Um, and I'll make a prediction of where I think this area will be in 50 years. I'll make a couple. Give you two choices. Um, and then finally, if there's any time, there are a couple major issues that I'm really interested in and would like to promote. So if there's time, one is about schools and teachers. And um, uh, schools and teachers really account for very little of the variance of academic achievement and um, should not be the focus of the improving academic achievement as it is. It's not that it's not important to have good teachers. I think it is. It's just that they're not that powerful when you look at variance accounted for. The second area is, uh, as many of you know, I have argued for some time, <clears throat> there's no such thing as G. Uh, there is G, but it's not a thing. It's a system and relationships in other parts of the system. So the first thing you should know is that intelligence is the most important thing that can be studied. And I truly believe this. It's more important than climate change, than curing cancer, than space travel, than eliminating poverty, uh, the cause of the Big Bang, than anything, um, species extinction, or anything you can think of. And the reason that it is, it's, is because all of these puzzles depend on human intelligence, the most important human ad adaptation for their solution. Um, and I truly believe this. I think all of you should too. Uh, it's, a, it's a topic that needs to be studied. We need to recruit help in studying it. And I hope uh, some of you will be convinced to, to follow along. The second thing you should know is that people are beginning to realize the importance of intelligence. <clears throat> Here is a graph. What I did was take the word intelligence and find the articles that were classified under the word intelligence um, over decades. And so what you see is the average number of articles published in each decade um, from from um, 1900 all the way to 2010. And what you can see is an accelerating curve. You see it dipping. I picked the word intelligence because it's often not politically wise to use the word intelligence. <clears throat> and many people use the word general cognitive ability or other kinds of words. Um, and I think the use of intelligence went down after the publication of the Bell Curve for many of the reasons that were discussed, have been discussed already. So let's start with psychometrics. And there, have been, there has been major progress in psychometrics. Uh, where was psychometrics when I first entered psychology? Um, it was in uh, uh, classical psychometrics were well developed. Um, there were many factor analytic theories that were just theories. There wasn't an actual factor analysis. Many people failed to realize that. Um, there were a few exceptions, Spearman, Thurstone, but not Cattell and Guilford. And many people think of those as factor analytic theories. It wasn't until Horn came along that, 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 that Guilford, that the Cattell theory really had factor analytic evidence. And even when there was factor analytic evidence, <coughs> the analyses that had been done were fairly small small n. So what have we learned uh, since then? What do we know in 2016? We know about the long-term reliability. Um, it's been confirmed in spades. We know it well. Um, item response theory is widely used for test development and improvement. Um, factor analysis is easy to do and far better understood. Uh, and I'll tell you more about that in a minute. G is dominant. People have realized how important general intelligence is. And G correlates across batteries. We know that from uh, work by Johnson and Bouchard. And there's been at least one study using confirmatory factor maps. Just one that I know of. Um, and so, uh, 
the theories are not well discriminated even when confirmatory factor analysis is used. So I, I think we can still use more work in that area. We know about the Flynn effect, we didn't know about before. Although it, it had been identified by Tottenham as early as the 40s and, and others, people have talked about that. And ethnicity, we know a lot more about ethnicity. Um, and it's an important topic, and I think it should be addressed directly. I think we can do it in a more diplomatic way. Um, for instance, uh, you might look at Asians versus whites. <laughs> Uh, and that may, might be important to our future. It's also the case, probably, that Asians are discriminated against in college admission, at least in the UN. So that would be a more diplomatic way to do it. Country IQ is going to be important and increasingly important. As countries learn that countries with the highest IQ are the ones that get ahead, they're going to want to improve their country's IQs. Okay, what caused all this progress in psychometrics? I use this, I don't know if you want to call it an analogy or a metaphor, but uh, what caused the progress in psychometrics? Well, let me tell you. Um, this is the computer I started on. It's less powerful than my um, smartphone. Uh, the next computer I got was an Apple. And that was a, a step up. Actually, I could keep it on my desktop. I didn't have to go to computer centers at night and use what was cheaply an administrative computer. And then I got a Terai, which is, um, had graphics and a bit more memory. But I, I happened to be in San Antonio working with the Air Force. And this PC's limited built a clone of the, the, uh, the IBM AT computer, which was heaven to me at the time. So I bought, bought a copy in the mail, by mail, from a computer magazine. The company happened to be in San Antonio, so I got it pretty quickly, but I got it. And the serial port didn't work. Um, and I said, that was so only an hour, an hour and a half from San Antonio to... Uh, so I drove over and found the place where these things were being built in a little you know, office place off the, off, the, uh, uh, off the highway. And I went into the office and I said, my computer's not working. The secretary's sitting there. I want to speak to the owner. And she said, uh, Mr. Dell's in a meeting right now. <laughs> And that's Mr. Dell. I never did meet him, but I took my computer to a warehouse and they fixed it in the day. So um, it's the closest I've gotten to it. Um, so why is this important? Why is it important? Well, when I was in graduate school, I was hired by Ray Powell, who was head of our psychology department, to help in, in factor analyzing the MMPI. And to go back, uh, that's the computer we used, the exact computer. And if you look at um, the matrix size that would be required, would be 130,144. Um, and it uh, had a memory limit of 65,000. So you can't keep the whole matrix in memory. Some of you are old enough to remember this. So what you had to do is write the matrix to tape part of it and then solve part of it and keep doing that. It took about three weeks of all-night sessions uh, to get a factor analysis of a 520, uh, 512 by the matrix. Now you press the button, the result spit out. Um, the current computer I have is pictured here along with um, uh, my introductory psychology book, um, the Clifford Morgan, and that is a Dell Optiplex. It's smaller than um, 
the textbook. And here's the computer IQ. Uh, Microsoft provides a little index. And you'll note that uh, it's very powerful. The top, top of the scale is 7.9. But they give it a 5.9 because the, I didn't get a solid state hard drive. And that's only 5.9, so it's the lowest in the, in the uh, list. And so they take the lowest substrate. And that'll be important later right, if I get to, get to it. All right, some of the things that I would like to see done are better factor analytic models using uh, confirmatory factor analysis. Uh, on large samples. Um, you may think this is re reinventing, uh, but I think it, it would be important to know those things. Um, more confirmatory factor analysis of the structure of mental abilities. I don't think we have a precise enough definition of the structure of mental abilities, and I'd like to see it improved. Um, can we identify specific abilities beyond G with added added a predictive power. David Lubinsky has done some of this. Spatial ability, um, tilt. Um, and then um, additional effects, uh, or efforts to specify specific abilities. Here's where I talk about tilt. And um, good examples of where this has been very useful are both in uh, music and sports where they've looked at spe special abilities and been able to identify things that actually predict beyond G in general intelligence. Uh, and I wish there was more of that. In fact, I urge all of you to come uh, to David Epstein's talk tomorrow. I think it's the best popular trade book that I've ever read um, about these topics. It's, it's, it's really magnificent. Um, too often, uh, people who write popular books fill in with examples and don't have an underlying theory or con the, the, the appropriate constructs. And he does. Um, so also, I'd like to see uh, explanations for special competencies like prodigies, idiots, adults, musical, athletic, and so forth. Um, I think we'll only do that when we have a good description of lower level uh, abilities. Ratio measurement is another important um, issue. We wouldn't have, have had the recent unpleasantness uh, in this room if we had ratio measurement. Because most of the things that we worry about would be solved immediately. We could uh, measure things on a ratio scale. We wouldn't have to look at Flynn effects or things like that. We know if something changed. The reason that we don't know when things change is because we don't have ratio measurement. We just have at best integral measurement. Okay, let's talk about cognitive, which is the field that I work most in. This field started at zero, and I mean zero. When I entered the field, there was almost nothing. Uh, and there was a good reason for that. Skinnerians believed, and many people believed, and you'll see this is a persistent belief through this whole thing in 1966, that um, uh, mental processes were, was a, any mental process was a dirty word. Cognitive is a dirty word. Uh, the only thing available was Piaget's structuralism for cognitive processing. And even Piaget, uh, may, maybe you've heard the story about when he came to the US and refused to speak English, even though he did, um, because he, he was ignored completely at that time. Not until John Flavel wrote his book which was about when I was in undergraduate school, was the work he did uh, made available. Some people were doing memory work and discrimination learning and things like that, 
but there was not much else. And they were rebels um, outside of the mainstream. Now we have a well-developed theory of working memory. We have um, many compre uh, more comprehensive models of cognitive functioning. Um, we have better modeling methods. We have um, rampant speculation about the underlying processes. And, and we've seen that here. There's been all kinds of speculation, which I encourage and think is great. Um, we know vaguely that complexity is related somehow to G. Um, and uh, so there's some ideas here. I'd like to see better testable mathematical models of cognitive processes. I'd like to see complexity explained. It hasn't been explained. I tend to think that it's uh, probably related to central processes and, and how well they work. But there's a chance I'll talk about that later. Um, also, more specific information about basic processes, particularly central processes. Um, relate basic processes to, to genes and, and brain processes. You can see that's already beginning to happen. And I think it's going to happen very quickly. I hope it does. Some people may be less positive. Neuroscience. There's been major progress in, in neuroscience. And by the way, the computer analogy fits here too. What has led to this progress is that we have incredible technical developments that have allowed us to actually see the brain working. So it's been a great time to be alive, but it'll be an even greater time once we figure out what these tools are actually capable of. Um, when I started in 1966, uh, all you had was lesions in humans and brain injury to judge. And in fact, those things have very small effects on intelligence. So it's hard to figure out exactly what's going on. If the people live, that's a major qualification. Um, and there's, there was a little discussion at the time of brain and intelligence. Um, some people did talk about it, but not much. The, the major thing that was that had just been discovered in the 60s was the P300 average to vote potentials. And there was a science article and subsequent to the development of that. And that was about it. Um, now what we do have, this, this first one is a a PET, positron emission tomography, which was the first um, real advance. And uh, when this became available, Rich Heyer went around to psychology departments and said every psychology department should have a PET scan. Uh, now, it's a little difficult because you have to have radioactive isotopes, <laughs> oxygen or glucose, and they have to be manufactured because they decay quickly, so near there, so you have to have a cyclotron, um, <laughs> which made it, but he persevered and produced what I think is uh, uh, the first article that led to a lot of neuroscience. And this is a famous study where on the left you see a brain high activity, over here, and here you see a brain with low activity. This Raven's progressive matrix is 11, and this one is 33, something like that. So the smart guys on the right, the not so smart guys on the left, this was while they were taking the Ravens and Dance Progressive Matrices. Um, so, um, then this is the next progression. This is a very old MRI machine, um, and 10 to 12 years ago, 20 years ago maybe. MRI came along and produced startling images like this, uh, where you could see the human brain and start identifying parts of the human brain, classify their size, look at them um, in various cuts in any way you want, make a three-dimensional image. And now, uh, 
with this technique, the future ten tensor imaging, uh, you get these beautiful pictures of white matter and how they're connected. And uh, you can even see where, uh, where the tracks go and how, what direction they're moving. Um, now, people are starting to look at the whole connectivity in the brain and how it works. And uh, so you get these kinds of images uh, that are startling. You show you where the nodes are, where things are connected. Uh, the next step is the mathematical um, development of, of uh, what they call here rich nodes, rich networks, rich clubs, I guess, um, in, in networks. And then recently, I just saw this, I haven't read the article yet, I think it's out, um, that scientists are able to um, find the functional brain networks seen, seen in images, the genetic underpinnings of these uh, brain networks. And so, very quickly, things are converging. And I think it's a, it's a great fun. Um, what we have, the, the major contribution, I think, that people have talked about here, that, that's sort of the basis for what's being developed now, is the PFIT model. And that was really developed in meta-analysis. And um, there, it needs a lot more experimental work to be um, developed, but, but it's so much better than anything <clears throat> that, that was available in 1966. Um, so, what I'd like to see done is identify brain pathways for specific tasks or um, better uh, specific cognitive skills. Um, find models of cognitive functioning uh, to uh, match to brain processes. If any of you have seen Rich Heiner's movie of a reaction time, pathways moving through the brain from the visual cortex to to the brain, the process it takes. It's quite impressive. He can't often get it to work, but when he does, <laughs> it is impressive. Um, link brain processes to genetics. Uh, and not, I'll talk about genetics. And I've ordered genetics a blue ribbon because I think the, the progress here has been just incredible. Um, Here are behavioral pub behavior genetic publications. And you can see what's happening to the, to the stars here. And here's a, a more important one. Um, the brown stripes there are, um, what are they? human molecular genetics. The, the black stripes are human quantitative genetics. And what you can see is that molecular genetics is taking off. Just do part Robert Coleman and his group put this together. Um, OK. So then and now. Um, in 1963, there was a meta-analysis, it wasn't called meta-analysis then, it's called a review, published in, in Science. And when I was in graduate school, a student brought this to me and said, can you believe this? I said, what do you mean? Can you believe I was working in mental retardation, I was interested in intellectual disabilities. I knew that there were genetic difficulties that produced intellectual deficits. He said, look, like I said, there's some heredity here. So I read the paper, and yeah, it wasn't surprising to me, but to everyone else it was surprising. Here's what the author said, and it, I think it pretty well captures. This is Erwin Meyer Kimmel in German. Nomothetic psychological theories have been distinguished by the tendency to disregard the individual variability, which is characteristic of all behavior. A parallel between genetic individuality and psychological individuality has rarely been drawn because the usual assumption has been, as recently noted in these pages, that the organisms intervening between stimulus 
response are equivalent black boxes, which react in uniform ways to given stimuli. Um, people at that time, if you were a behavior geneticist, uh, <laughs> were, were attacked on a regular basis. Um, and for all kinds of reasons. Um, Arthur Jensen, when he wrote a paper about uh, suggesting that the differences in educational outcomes might be due to intellectual differences, um, was, was actually tracked around the country, protested. Um, it was astounding. I'm sure that Robert Plowman suffered some of these uh, indignities. Um, and uh, it has gotten better. Um, so what I'm going to do is go through, I'll just go through these quickly since you've already seen them. Somebody stole my paper. <laughs> these are, um, these are Plumman and DeFries, et etc. The 10 replicated findings from genetics. Uh, all, all psychological traits show substantial, uh, significant and substantial genetic influence. No traits are 100% heritable. Heritability is caused by many genes. Um, phenotypic correlations between the psychological traits show significant substantial genetic mediation. Uh, the heritability of intelligence increases throughout development. Um, age to age stability is mainly due to genetics. Um, most measures of environment show significant genetic influence. A few words about this. We know nothing about environment. We know absolutely nothing about environment. And I will never believe anything about environment unless it's done within a behavior genetic appropriate design. So, um, most of the things about environment have turned out to be wrong and they've been painful to watch them turn out to be wrong because they've required an extreme amount of energy. Um, when if they'd used a behavior genetic design to look at these things, they might have made some progress, although it's not easy. Um, most associations between environmental measures and psychological traits are significantly related genetically. A good example is parenting. Um, most environmental effects are not shared by children growing up in the same family. Abnormal is normal. This is one I like. What this means is there, there is no abnormal. It's just extremes of a, of a normal distribution. So, uh, okay. What I'd like to see done is relate specific SNPs to genes uh, or genes to, to brain development. Understand the biochemistry of brain functioning, which is moving right along itself. Um, understand uh, course of brain development over the lifespan. And environment, as I said, it's, it's extremely important to understand it, but it's extremely difficult to understand. G by E interactions are extremely important, but the environment is a big word. And there are a lot of variables out there. And so finding the ones that are important is not going to be easy. I think it's the biggest challenge that we face, actually. Um, GPS. Uh, this is the general Plumman score. Um, and it will predict educational achievement at birth. Um, probably better than IQ tests at 11 years predict it now, eventually. Um, and I think that will be extremely important, and we'll see why later. So now I want to talk a little about the criteria predicted. Um, this be very good. When I went to undergraduate college, uh, we knew that you could predict academic achievement, although some people didn't believe it. The military used it in selection quite successfully. Uh, employment and college admission were we used to test, although they didn't call it an intelligence test. Now, um, there are measures of academic achievement to improve schools, in particular teaching. That's what they seem to focus on. Um, human capital measures in employment uh, are important. Um, prediction of, of a multitude of other characteristics 
including the following list, which I'll not read to you. Uh, this is uh, Jensen's list that I've modified and added some things to. But it's incredible the number of things that have been found to be related to intelligence. We knew some of those in 1966, but all of these have some relationship to intelligence. Um, so, um, what next? Uh, ideas. Devised interventions aimed directly at students. More about that later. It looks like I'm on that time. Why aren't intelligent people uniformly successful? And can the odds be improved? Uh, if you look at Lubinsky's work, you know, very high IQ people are, are fairly successful. I mean, some aren't. And, um, you know, it's like throwing gold away when those people aren't successful. Why is intelligence related to health status and many other things that have been found to uh, be correlated with intelligence? There's a lot of work to be done in explaining why intelligence predicts so much. All right, so let me make a little summary of progress from 66. The progress has been incredible in every area. I think there's, it's just an amazing scientific feat that we've come so far. Um, even more important, the stage is set for even greater uh, progress. As we've seen in some of the papers today, people have different ideas about what these things mean um, in neuroscience, and genetics, and what the right approach is. But I think um, there's, just look at the curves that I showed you for behavior genetics, for intelligence citations. Uh, it's lot to the um, tools now are available to answer the questions. We have an array of amazing tools that can be used to answer uh, the questions of what, what intelligence is. People are more receptive to the idea of intelligence. It's a much better psychosis. Nobody calls behavior geneticists bad names of And that's uh, an accomplishment. They make all other people bad. Okay, now I'm going to get to the part that I shouldn't engage in, but I will. Um, predicting the future. People always underpredict. So I'll try to base it on some sense of what, what's going to happen. This is a good book, uh, The In Industries of the Future. It was written by uh, Alec Ross, who was Hillary Clinton's um, tech person, science person. And so he looked at all kinds of things about employment and so forth, and I, I used most of the stuff from this book. Um, what will happen over the next 50 years? In fact, it'll happen quicker than 50 years, but it'll keep unrolling over the next 50 years. The internet revolution and automation will continue at a quickening pace. There's no doubt about it. Um, Whatever can be put on the internet, whatever can be automated, whatever will be. And there are a lot of things that can be. And they're getting better at doing it all the time. It's estimated that 40 to 60 percent of current jobs will disappear. 40 to 60 percent. Talk to journalists, talk to uh, you know, people who've been affected by this already. Um, a large portion of the jobs will be held by people with IQs less than 115. That's 84% of the population, as Linda just convincingly showed you. Um, so here's employment rates for different quartiles of, uh, of the individuals from most highly educated on the basis of education. So you can see already that employment is difficult at the low end of the of the continuum. Um, let's take this one, one example. In the next decade, we will have self-driving cars. You can already get a Tesla that self-drives. You may have heard about the accident that, that occurred with the Tesla. Uh, it only, it only self-drives on highways. It doesn't. But Google is getting very close to having a self-driving car. 
which I'm going to buy as soon as it, <laughs> as soon as it comes out. Um, and this will have an effect uh, on cars and trucks and on people who drive them. In the U.S. in 2014, there were 3,351,400 heavy truck, light truck, delivery truck, and taxi drivers in the U.S. And that makes up 3% of the U.S. Uh, employees. Uh, that, those people will be out of work probably in 20 years. Um, if you don't believe me, um, Uber has amassed $12 billion in, in um, financing. It's not so they can run a taxi company. It's because they're setting up the internet structure to plug in self-driving cars. And when they do that, um, taxis will get cheaper, uh, taxi drivers will be out of business, truck drivers will be out of business, um, they'll find ways to deliver things much more efficiently, maybe the person at the end will have to unload it somehow, or, but um, it will happen. And that's just one area. And you can think of other areas where this same thing is going to happen. Okay. This will not only affect low-end jobs, but it will affect some people at the high end. For instance, people who manage the flow of information and collate information will also be affected. Uh, one example he gives, because his father happens to be a, re a real estate lawyer, is that real estate lawyers will be put out of business because they mainly do sort of standard paperwork to, to close a house. Um, but other people, maybe even teachers, will be put out of business. Um, so employment dislocation will be widespread and rapid. Um, I, I think there's no doubt about that. And some of the, the discontent we're seeing in the world today is largely due to people in the lower end of the IQ distribution seeing the writing on the wall and being unhappy about it and not knowing what's going to happen. So retraining people will quickly will become essential to avoid um, widespread political dissatisfaction. To do this, we're going to have to understand intelligence. And to retrain people for jobs that they can actually do. Now, the most desirable jobs for people who can quickly learn these things will be the, the smartest people. Uh, so, everyone in this room is probably safe. Now, there's an easy cure for all this. And the easy cure is presented in this book, The End of Sex, don't worry, the, the next part of the text, and the future of reproduction, uh, which argues that sex will just be recreational. Reproduction will proceed as follows. Two people will take skin cells. They will, they will produce gametes from these skin cells. And then maybe they'll uh, fertilize 100 eggs take a cell from each egg, test it genetically, and then you get to pick your kid. So, um, people will select their children. Um, GPS might be a mechanism for selection. Not just on intelligence, but on other kinds of uh, um, traits. People will select to have smart children. I think there's no doubt about that. It's the highest uh, assorted of mating characteristic we have. People want smart kids, and particularly in a difficult situation. Countries will encourage citizens to have smart children. China, I think, is already doing this. They have high schools for um, high IQ kids, where they hope that they'll get married and have kids. Um, 
there will probably be a smart race. People are going to realize that it's the upper echelons of um, IQ that produce good results for the country. So which country will be smartest? Um, you might want to think about China in this, this respect. Uh, but who knows? Um, education will be tailored to each person's cognitive ability. It's determined by genetics, uh, uh, yeah, genetics, brain function, and unique cognitive skills. I'm def defining an ideal world here uh, that's really not so ideal. Um, that was the easy cure. The problem with the easy cure is that it would probably genetic variability, which is a bad thing for a species. Because if the world changes in extreme ways, it's not good to have a, a species of, with limited genetic variability. So I think there's a better cure that will depend on how hard all of you work. And that is to understand intelligence to use the understanding to devise interventions that optimize learning for all levels of intellectual ability. Some people have suggested smart pills, educational interventions, life interventions, all of these things. Okay, uh, that, that concludes the, this part. I think I have a few minutes to um, go over this one issue that I, I think I'll only have time for one of these issues. Um, The current focus for raising academic achievement is mostly on schools. People concentrate on schools. They blame schools, they blame teachers. Um, they want to improve teachers. Uh, but the efforts have had little success. In the US, no child left behind all the programs that have been done, which I, I applaud, regular testing of kids, have not been effective. Why haven't they? Well, it's because schools and teachers have only a very small effect on academic achievement. Most people don't realize this. I was, years ago, I was at uh, a grant review for uh, educational grants. I was an outside reviewer for a bunch of educational grants, special programs. And um, there were a bunch of educators sitting around the table. And one of the, uh, the grants was on teacher training, teacher improvement. And I asked them, what proportion of the variance is accounted for by teachers? Seems like a question they should be able to answer. Uh, and we went around, and I just said, okay, you know, people, so let's just go around the table, give me your guess. And the guesses range from like 20% to higher like 60% of, of variance was accounted for by teachers in, in academic achievement. Um, well, at that time, although I wasn't aware of it at the time, uh, we already knew that that wasn't true. The Coleman Report in 1966 is, is one that you might want to look at. It was required by the Civil Service Act, Rights Act of 1964, Section 402, mandated that a, that a, that a uh, data be collected when um, desegregate, before desegregation occurred. Uh, and the reason was that black schools were thought to be just terrible. They were, um, mostly black schools got hand-me-downs from white schools 10 years out of date. Um, and they were in terrible buildings and all kinds of problems. So, uh, they collected data from 4,000 public schools, 645,000 students, grades 1, 3, 6, 9, and 12, um, and gave ability tests, academic achievement tests, and surveys of uh, principals, teachers, and students. And the results were released on July 4th, which is American Independence Day. And you might ask, did they release it because it was patriotic? No, they released it so no one would see it uh, because it was a slow news day. Um, the results did not come out in any way as they had anticipated they would. 
teachers accounted in this study for 1% of the variance. Um, schools accounted for 10 to 20% of the variance, and that was too high at the time. Um, whites were the most segregated group, and still are. Um, it's interesting. So the conclusion was that most of the differences were between students within schools and not between schools. It makes no difference. And there have been numerous follow-up studies. Uh, one of the better ones was by James Smith, Auckland, and Bain. Um, and it upheld the results. And it, in, in their analysis, only 10% of variance in academic achievement was due to schools. So teachers had to be less than 10% of the variance. Another one by Gammon and Long reviewed 40 years of data from developing countries and found that if the average per capita income was greater than $16,000 per year, and this was in 2006, um, schools accounted for 10% of the variance or less. So it's a small amount of variance. Um, now, does this apply to colleges and universities as well? Well, there's a very interesting study by Ang Hoff and Johnson where they took 22,923 students who had taken the SAT and four to five years later took the GRE. Both are intelligence sets are They're supposed to be achievement tests. Um, so they were able to select about 8,000 of these students at 292 colleges or universities where there were at least 10 students enrolled. And so they were interested in seeing how much uh, variance was accounted for by, um, by uh, the, the universities, the different universities. So they used SAT math and the student's major and gender to predict GRE math. Very frequently, GRE math or math scores are used because they're more variable and they're more affected by uh, education. They found an R squared of 93, meaning that only 7% of the variance across colleges um, was due to uh, teachers or whatever else was school. And in fact, the U.S. have a large number of colleges. They use 292 here, but there's something like 4,000 secondary institutions. Anybody who wants to go to college can. Um, some schools accept everybody that applies. Uh, the conclusion here, though, is that um, no more than 7% of the variance could be due to teachers, and it doesn't matter where you go to college, basically. What matters? Any guesses? how smart you are, that's what matters. Um, and in fact, uh, SAT is really an indication of the, the quality of the college. Uh, it's very highly correlated with any rating of college quality. And it doesn't matter whether you go to college at a, at a school with high SATs or a lower SAT. What matters is your SAT. Um, that's what that study shows. Um, oh, I, this slide is out of order. This is another, oh no, no it's not, I'm sorry. Um, there are some direct measures of teacher effectiveness, or teacher uh, effects on academic achievement, and they've been mostly collected by Whitehurst, and uh, who was a former secretary of education. Um, and these academic achievement scores are for a decade worth of data from Florida and North Carolina. And they include uh, 23, 23 million points, data points for the decade. And what they show is that um, teachers are here. I think that's, is that right? Yeah, 4% of the variance. And this is students and controls. All of this is student in control. This little part up here is school, anything associated with the school. So you have a uh, uh, superintendent, what is the district, and this, which adds up to 90%, is either student or control variables, 
And the control variables are all related to the students, whether they get free lunch, so forth. Uh, next, we have uh, the same thing only for math. And in this case, they account for, teachers account for a little bit more, 6.7% of the variance. But still, we get 90%. They, they take it from other places in the, in the, in the college, uh, or in the school, and they get 90% of variance. Um, Okay, so there are specific estimates of teacher uh, effects in schools, and Julia showed one in the first talk, 5%. 5%? So if not teachers at schools, then it's students. So we have to pay attention to students and uh, their needs if you want to improve education. Never do it with uh, with, uh, you know, it's like asking somebody to move the world with a very short lever. And that's what we're asking teachers to do. And blaming them if it doesn't get done. So, um, there's substantial evidence that um, education is, educational achievement is closely related to intelligence. Here's a study by Deary and others where they took a bunch of uh, English school kids who take taken a cat and then the GCSE, which is a term we're all becoming familiar with, but it's frequently used now, as a, and it's great. Um, and so we found 13,248 who took the same subjects, because you can take different subjects at a time. And this is what he found. Um, he, he was a very diplomatic and label these factors F1 and F2, not, not G in uh, education, but in achievement. Um, and the correlation there is 0.81. So the latent variables correlate 0.81. Uh, the next, there are two also um, published here. The correlation is 0.83. So academic achievement is related to intelligence very closely. Um, uh, there's a lot of other evidence that predicts what academic achievement does, um, and uh, we've already seen this graph. And um, it very clearly shows that intelligence is an important predictor of, of uh, academic achievement. And so the focus should be on students not on schools or teachers. That's a point I want to make. The second major issue I will talk about will take an hour. So if you, uh, but it's a, it's um, basically will be, pub will be published in um, Psychological Inquiry sometime this month. Uh, it's a comment on process overlap. It's a simulation of comment on a theory proposed by Conway, Kovacs and Conway, which is quite interesting. Basically, what I did in this article was to simulate a basic uh, system of intelligence um, and show that this system, if you just assume, like we did on the computer, that the lowest process determines the output, um, then uh, you can explain uh, at least five things. There we go. So it, this, you can produce a simulation that will um, have mental tests correlate with each other, even though each process is assigned randomly. You just assign a normal deviate to each of those processes, um, and then. You can also show that differentiation is um, the lower half has higher correlations than the, the upper half of the distribution, and that le less complex tests have lower correlations, that is, they get rid of some of those central processes. The correlations will be lower for less complex tests. And then um, 
you can combine these less complex tests to predict the more complex tests, but they don't predict it completely. To do that, you have to identify each of those central processes specifically and use those for prediction. The other thing I've always been puzzled about is that IQ tests are great, they give you a score, but that's it. For years, clinicians have looked for scatter, for anything they could find that would differentially predict um, why, you know, the particular intellectual problem that somebody had. It doesn't work. Um, none of these methods work. You know, performance higher than verbal, uh, just doesn't work when it's tested. And the reason is that it, it can't work because a complex system is complex and you have to take it apart before you can really understand it and find out what's going wrong. So we also demonstrated that um, if you put deficits in a complex system in particular parts, you can predict what's wrong with the system if you have the individual parts to, for the prediction. So that ends my talk. I hope you will all go out and solve the world's problems, and I, I get to see some progress while I'm still alive. <laughs> Thank you.